UFC 303 is coming up next weekend, and today, guys, I am going to be breaking down the entire card from start to finish. We're going to be breaking down the fights. I'm going to be talking about the betting side of things, who I would like to see to win the fight, and we're going to dive into it literally as much as we possibly can. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another video. If you are new here, my name is Kyle. I am your guy with many YouTube channels, and welcome back to another full card breakdown, guys. If you are interested in hearing my take on any particular fight, timestamps will be there. If you'd like to skip to any particular fight, let's get into the video for today, guys. And starting off the card, guys, this card is absolutely phenomenal. I'm already using the wrong thing. I'm already using the wrong OBS scene. I got a stream deck, guys, and it's been very difficult <laughs> to get used to all the buttons. But anyways, guys, so we're starting off the card with Charles Jordan versus Gene Silva. Gene Silva had a fight recently canceled. And I was very excited to see him back into the UFC because he broke into the UFC and he was just so entertaining because... He had that ridiculous walkout. I don't even know how long it was. It took like, what, like five minutes or something? I'm not exaggerating. It probably was that. He walked so slowly. He was barking at the camera. It was so strange. But then the only problem is he took on Weston Wilson. I know Weston Wilson just got a win, but Weston Wilson isn't the best opponent to take on to kind of gauge your skills. He's taking on a huge jumping competition, that being Charles Jordan. I'll start with Charles Jordan. He is a fast, come-forward striker with solid durability, and he has, like... At times, not always, because sometimes he does like to get wild. He has nice timing on his shots. He also has some really good grappling to go along with it. But as I was saying, sometimes Charles Jordan can take risks and go with the flashy approach to his fights. And every now and then, that can work against him. But sometimes it works out well for him. So you never really know what you're getting with Charles Jordan. And I am a big fan of Charles Jordan, man. I love watching this dude fight. He always brings it. Now, he is taking on, like we were just talking about, Lord Assassin Gene Silva. Can't wait to see this guy again. He is a very good striker with good power, solid takedown defense. So the problem is, I feel like we kind of at this point know where Charles Jordan fits within the featherweight division because he's 15 and 7. He's had some wins. He's had some losses. And these two performances against Cron Gracie and Ricardo Ramos, he looked pretty good. But the problem is this Sean Woodston fight. It was a split decision. I personally thought that Sean Woodston won this fight. And oh my God, I'm saying it again. I got a lot of criticism because I kept saying Woodston instead of Woodson. I'm sorry. I don't know why I do that. My apologies, everybody. But Sean just uses boxing this fight to kind of stay on the outside and coast his way to decision. And for this fight in particular, I don't really take too much away from it because in this fight, Sean was just so big and oversized. It looked like they were in complete different weight classes over here. So it was difficult for Charles Jordan to get the win. So I don't feel like Charles Jordan necessarily lost any of the momentum that he was gaining over here. Plus, it was a split decision. Again, I believe he lost this fight, but... It was just a really, really bad matchup. Sean is just, he's got that weird Waluigi build with, he was like taking down a table, I think Dominic Cruz described it. So he's a very weird guy to fight. So I'm interested to see if Charles Jordan can continue to improve. Problem being, Gene Silva, we don't know where he fits. Because from what we've seen so far, and especially recently, he's been very, very dominant. He has some good striking, but... He hasn't taken on anybody like Charles Jordan, and something that I am worried about Gene Silva with is this dude is way too cocky. He's going to get cracked one day. Charles Jordan can crack. Charles, I could see Gene Silva just casually walking forward, hands down, using his power to kind of dominate, and this is where Charles Jordan will throw a flashy head kick. I could very well see that happening. I don't know how good Gene Silva's chin is. Like, it's, it's tough. You're throwing him into the dogs of the UFC so far right away in your career. And I know he already got the win over here against Weston Wilson, but, man, I just, again, I, I have trouble figuring out where I think he belongs in the division. So, for this fight, I will give a very, very slight lean to Charles Jordan. I think he has more tools, more experience, and he's taken on guys better than Gene Silva, in my opinion, as of right now. Gene Silva could, could come out to be something special. But this is a very low-level confidence pick. I'm kind of like 60-40 on this one. And for who I would like to see one, guys, honestly, I'm as I said, I am a big Charles Jordan fan. I love watching the dude fight. I've been a fan of his for a very, very long time. And I hope he makes his way up to the championship one day. Because, again, he's been he's been improving, man. But let's take a look at what Odds Jam is saying over here on the betting side of things. So, Gene Silva, Charles Jordan, money line. You can see Gene Silva is a slight underdog. See, that kind of makes sense to me. That's kind of where I'm sitting over here. And I, for me personally, I won't be betting on this fight because, again, I'm having trouble figuring out where Gene Silva fits into the division. But I can't wait for the fight, man, and I will definitely be rooting for Charles Jordan. Now, guys, let's move on to the next fight, and there's not a ton of breakdown for this fight, in my opinion, because we have Andre Arlovsky taking on Martin Bidet. Andre Arlovsky, 45 years old, pushing 46 over here, so... 
I'll start with Andrei Orlovsky. He's a really powerful heavyweight who could do it all, but the problem is he's old now. He's 45, and it really, really showed. It's been showing recently. It's been showing for a long time. He's been kind of... There wasn't really with Andrei Orlovsky a really big, like, okay, boom, this performance, he's really old now. But in each performance that we've seen him, his age has become more evident. Now, he has been defying the test of time. He's been performing well for a 45-year-old. Either that or the heavyweight division is that bad. I think it's Andre Arlovsky kind of defying time a little bit. But in his most recent performance against Waldo Cortez Acosta, he really, really looked like the age is finally hitting him. He, was, he showed that he's 45 years old. He just couldn't keep up. And Waldo Cortez Acosta is nothing special in my opinion. So he's riding a three-fight losing streak and... I can only imagine it's going to continue. Like I said, he's a power heavyweight. He could have done it all. He was a great, great fighter and a great champion back in his day. But of course, like I said, he's old now. It's sad to see with his record 34 and 23 at this point. He's taking on Martin Bidet, who's coming off of his first loss as of recently to Shamil Gaziev. And that loss has not aged too well. <laughs> Martin Bidet is a really, really big guy who just sees your typical heavyweight in the sense where he wants to come in and knock you out. Sometimes... He does have low volume when he shows up, though, but sometimes he also has good footwork for heavyweight, so I don't really know. He's one of those guys, kind of like I was just talking about Gene Silva. I'm having trouble figuring out where he belongs at the top of the division. I don't think he's going to really make it too far, but he's had performances where he's looked good. He's had performances where he looked subpar, and he's he hasn't taken on literally, he hasn't really taken on anybody of significance, in my opinion, and Shamil Gaziev losing to him hasn't really looked all that good, but then again, you could just, anybody can catch anybody at heavyweight, so I don't want to put too much stock into that loss, but guys, like I said, there's not a ton of breakdown over here. Andre Arlovsky showed up in his last fight, looked, he looked 45, and Martin Bidet, 32 years old, almost 33 years old, he's had good performances against heavyweights, <laughs> but I, I think he's going to win this fight. I don't think there's a way Andre Arlovsky wins this fight, and if he wins this fight, uh, we have no we have no business predicting UFC over here because Andre Arlovsky should absolutely lose this fight. But honestly, guys, I've been a fan of Arlovsky for a really long time, and I would like to see him get the win. That would be really, really cool, but I don't think that's going to happen. You can see over on Odds Jam, Martin Bidet is a minus 250 favorite. That makes sense to me. I honestly think it could be a little bit higher. Maybe it's around there because it's heavyweight. Anything can happen. Plus, the heavyweight division does suck. I guess there is a world where Andre Arlovsky does get the win here, but I don't think that he's going to get the win. My pick is going to be Martin Bidet, 100%. Now, guys, for this next fight, I'm very, very interested in seeing how this is going to go because we have Peyton Talbot taking on Yanis Gamori. I want to talk about Peyton Talbot for a little bit. You know what? I'm going to break down the fighters first. So you have Peyton Talbot, who has a ton of hype behind him right now. He is a very good flashy striker with solid movement and great volume. He can strike and grapple, but... He definitely is 100% better a striker than a grappler. He oddly moves forward like a brick wall in that sense where it's like you can hit this dude and he will push forward with his pressure like as if like it didn't even touch him. It's like it's like the punches like are literally flicks. Like it's it's so weird so far what we've seen from Peyton Talbot. He's taking on Yanis Gamori who is a I don't know how short notice he is actually off the top of my head. Apologies if that is a lack of professionalism on my end, but there, Peyton Talbot had a different opponent, and I don't know how short notice this is. Regardless, he's taking on Yanis Gamori, who is a judo and black, excuse me, judo and BJJ fighter. He has okay hands, sometimes on the feet, though. He can show that he has good combinations, and when he's comfortable, he does have a good jab from a distance. But again, it's really nothing special. On the ground, he does have submissions, but he does have an issue with his offensive takedown. So Yanis Gamori is a, in my opinion, subpar fighter. This fight is kind of set up for Peyton Talbot to win, guys. I want to talk about Peyton Talbot for a minute because, you know what? We'll go through, like, Giannis Gamori coming off his first loss as of recently to William Gomez, his first UFC fight, and there was something weird about that fight, too. Why am I not remembering something about Giannis Gamori? But regardless, he came off uh, just nine months ago against a TKO from, from William Gomez, excuse me. And like I said, I was sorry, I was thinking about Peyton Talbot for a second, guys. Peyton Talbot, I was so wrong on. I was so wrong on because... I watched him in the Contender Series against Reyes Cortez, right? And he ended up getting the win, but he, in my opinion at least, he didn't look so good. He was trying to be creative with the striking, but it just looked weird to me. It was nothing special, and he even broke a record in that fight. But I was looking at it, I was like, okay, I don't understand the hype behind this guy. They were hyping this guy in the Contender Series. Breaks into the UFC. He still is insanely hyped up, and I don't remember who I picked in this fight. I probably picked Peyton Talbot, but in the first round... He came out and just ended up con being he ended up uh, being controlled on the ground, and I was like, okay, well, there's a clear hole in this game, and he ended up finding a submission. But then, against Cameron Simon, just two months ago, I was very confident in Cameron Simon to get the win over here. 
I think Cameron Simon is an extremely, extremely good fighter for the division. And I think Cameron Simon has all the potential in the world to be champion one day. So I hold a win over Cameron Simon as something really special. This is the fight where I was like, okay, perhaps I actually underestimated Peyton Talbot because he absolutely destroyed him. He murdered Cameron Simon. He walked forward like I was talking about, like a brick wall, as if Cameron couldn't do a thing to him. If Peyton Talbot does that to the rest of his opponents, that's championship potential, man. I was completely wrong on my read for this guy, and the way that he destroyed Cameron Simon, I'm totally on board with the Peyton Talbot train, because again, I think very highly of Cameron Simon. I don't like how much Peyton Talbot gets hit. I don't like that the potential is there for him to get taken down, but that offense, man, is something crazy. That's crazy. I think this fight's set up for Peyton Talbot to win. He's probably a massive favorite right now. He's improving. He's almost 26 years old. He's going to have the reach advantage and a slight height advantage. I think Anis Gamori cannot keep up with a fighter like Peyton Talbot right now. And honestly, guys, I kind of hope Yanis Gamori gets it done. I'm not too big on Peyton Talbot myself. A little bit of a strange guy. But anyways, regardless, I love watching the dude fight. And I cannot wait to watch Peyton Talbot fight. Let's take a look. Oh my god. This is what I'm talking about, guys. Peyton Talbot is a over minus 1,000 favorite. That's shocking. I don't even think this one's worth even touching as a potential upset. I mean, like, if you really want to look at it that way, like, Peyton Talbot's only 8-0. And, and Yanis, like, that, but Yanis Kamori hasn't shown anything where it's like, okay, he can beat a guy like Peyton Talbot. But, hey, you know what? Crazier things have happened, right? You also have an over 2.5 line as of right now. The over 2.5 is plus 114. That, I don't absolutely hate. But, again, I'm definitely not touching that myself. It's a very, very good fight mostly for Peyton Talbot. I can't wait to watch him perform again. I just want to see him fight somebody a little bit further up in the division because the dude, he has serious potential. So my pick is going to be, of course, Peyton Talbot. Continuing on, guys, I want to say that this is one of the fights that I'm looking forward to most in the entire card, but this is this entire card I'm looking forward to. This card is filled with just about nothing but bangers. We have Ricky Simone versus Viniscus Oliveira. Guys, Ricky Simone is a very, very underrated fighter, in my opinion. He's one of the most underappreciated fighters in the UFC. And I know he's coming off of two losses, and they've been rough losses against Mario Bartista and Song Yedong, but those are really, really quality losses to have. And he didn't, he didn't really, like, you know, I'll, I'll talk about him in just a second, okay? I'll talk about the recent performances. So, you have Ricky Simone, who is a high-pressure wrestler with great movement, who does a really good job at weaponizing his cardio, and he will pretty much do anything to get you onto the ground. At the point where, if he wants to spam takedowns, he will. He does have solid technique wherever the fight goes, and in my opinion, and I would love to know what you guys think about this down below, but I feel like Ricky Simone's striking has been making vast improvements every single time that we see him. He's still not at the level of some parts in the division. You saw that in his most recent two losses, he had problems with the striking, right? But I feel like Ricky Simone is still improving. He's taking on Viniscus Oliveira, who is a fighter that I am incredibly high on. He's riding a solid three-fight win streak, bursted on the Contender Series, looked super dominant over there, and against Bernardo Sopage, this is where I kind of looked at Vinicius Oliveira, and I was like, okay, you know what? This dude just might belong. He went to war for two rounds, and he just absolutely destroyed Sopage in the third. I He looked so good. The only problem is, and while I'm talking about this fight, there's one thing that I want to mention about this performance, is he started in this fight gassing out, in the third round, or at least appeared to gas out a little bit, but he still ended up pushing through, and th th there's a couple ways you could look at this, because he ended up getting a really insane knockout, right? He just, in my opinion, he's not invincible, okay? You could look at this two ways. You could look at it, okay, well, he needs to work on his cardio, but he's also one of those guys that has proven, especially in his last fight, that even though he's tired, he will force himself to continue on with the fight. The only problem is, are you able to force yourself against a guy with a cardio like Ricky Simone? Ricky Simone will definitely have a weapon there if he lasts. That's the big thing, okay? So I want to talk about Ricky Simone because he had a ton of hype in this win streak that he had over here. And he looked really good in a lot of his fights. But then, of course, he had the Song Yidong loss where it was a really tough fight. And I think Song Yidong could go out and he, he could contend with Sean O'Malley right now. I think he's that good. I'm not saying he would beat Sean O'Malley, but he, I think that Song Yidong will be champion one day. And then against Mario Bautista, it was... Honestly, it was an amazing performance. It was an amazing performance. He just ended up didn't get he he didn't end up getting the win over here. He just really really wasn't able to take over in the last round and then Mario Bautista ended up getting the win over here, but he showed heart, cardio, technique, everything that you would want to see in this fight. Like I think that 
I don't look at Ricky Simone right now saying like, okay, this dude's coming off of two really rough losses because they were both these were good performances against really good guys. And you have Vinicius Oliveira who has only had one fight against the contender that Ricky Simone is far better than. Far better than. Did I even break down Vinicius Oliveira? I didn't. <laughs> Oh man, I'm sorry. He <laughs> Vinicius Oliveira is a fighter who just wants to come forward and absolutely finish you. This dude is a dog, but he does have a lot of striking technique, but he doesn't always use it. Sometimes, and this is a problem with him, sometimes he's too confident, just like we we're talking about Gene Silva. He will swing wild with his hands down, but the thing is, he is just so powerful. He throws everything into every single shot. In saying that, though, he does a complete skill set. He, But like I was talking about, the other only problem is he. we've seen him fade. Especially in his last fight, he did fade. And that's something that Ricky Simone can absolutely weaponize. So when these two meet in the octagon, what's going to happen? Vinicius Oliveira will have a slight height advantage. Ricky Simone's in his prime right now. Vinicius Oliveira is entering his prime. I think you have the danger aspect over on the side of Oliveira. He can finish the fight anywhere. And Ricky Simone does get hit in his fights. <sighs> he can get hit by Vinicius Oliveira. I don't know, like, this is a really close fight, man, because I am convinced that Oliveira is a contender in the division, but I can see Ricky Simone using some really nice movement to evade everything that Oliveira throws, but then again, something is going to land eventually by Oliveira, and when something lands, it's a big deal. Ricky Simone does get hit. I can see him walking into a knee. I can see him taking Oliveira down. This is a fight that I could see going both ways, but honestly, guys, a little bit of a gut feeling. I think Vinicius Oliveira is going to get it done. I do. I can see this being a fraud check, though, because Ricky Simone has taken on the who's who of the division, and Vinicius Oliveira hasn't taken on somebody like Ricky Simone, but Ricky Simone's just had great performances against guys that are so much better than Vinicius Oliveira. Or as of right now, they're better than and more accomplished than Vinicius Oliveira. I can see this going either way, but I will be picking, actually, what I would imagine is the underdog in Vinicius Oliveira. Let's take a look at who, who what the uh, odds are, but first... For who I would like to see win this fight, guys, I would really, really like to see Ricky Simone win this fight because he is one of the most underappreciated fighters and underrated fighters in the entirety of the UFC, and I really hope that he makes his way up to a title like fight one day because, like we were talking about Charles Jordan earlier, it really hurts that, I mean, not actually, I'm not actually offended by it or anything, but it's it's sad to see that nobody talks about Ricky Simone because he's a fantastic fighter, and he takes on anybody, anytime, anywhere. He's a great, great fighter. I, I hope nothing but the best for him, and I hope he gets a win. So you can see... That Ricky Simone is a, about minus 200, almost going towards minus 300 favorite on some sports books. But you know what? That's an understandable line to me. I think it should be a little bit closer to a pick him with Ricky Simone maybe being a little bit of a favorite. It makes sense because, again, this is a huge, huge test and jump up in competition for Oliveira. But, man, I just, I, I think that the, Vinicius Oliveira belongs in the UFC and belongs towards the top of the division. And I think that him with his violent intent his huge power. I think there's points in this fight where he will catch Ricky Simone. And I, I'm going to pick him to win. I'm going to pick him to win this fight. But again, I'll be cheering for Ricky Simone. Guys, let's keep going up the card, though, to another banger. That being the return of Joe Body Bags Piper. Salty man Joe Piper, as Lucas Tracy would say. Coming fresh out of the salt mines to take on Mark andre Burial. This is a really good fight because I'm interested to see where Joe Piper bounce back, bounces back from his loss. So you have Joe Piper, who is an extremely powerful and heavy pressure striker. I don't know how much I believe it, but I, don't, I you know what? I don't believe it because everyone's like, oh my God, he punches harder than Francis Ngannou. That's not possible. I will never believe that, okay? I don't know where that came from. I don't know why, but regardless. Anyways, at the beginning of the fight, Joe Piper is just so explosive. Keyword being though, keywords at the beginning, at the beginning, at the very, in the first few minutes, he looks like he can hang with the top of the division. But what we've learned recently is he can fade. And what something else is when he starts to fade or even not necessarily like just in general the fight, he has serious problems when he is made to be the nail. Other than that, he solid and rangy jabs and leg kicks also can work on him. So we're finally seeing a difference in Joe Pfeiffer's performances because of course he looked like an absolute killer since he came into the UFC, destroyed his opponents. Then Jack Hermanson beat him and that was a really, really bad performance. Anyways, he's taking on Marc-Andre Burial, who is a striker with good cardio, dirty boxing, and he does a good job making the fights kind of dirty using his ugly, calculated chaos with pressure. I mean, in the sense where he makes the fights ugly, but within the war, he uses really good technique in there. So, 
I want to know what you guys think about this, and I would love to, I would love to pick your brains, honestly, if you can comment down below. I don't know if the damage of Marc-Andre Barriol is starting to catch up with him. I don't know, because I want to talk about his past two performances in particular, because, of course, he's always been a, he's always been a guy who, he comes in, he takes a lot of damage, he gives a lot of damage, he has had a lot of wars over the years now. My question is, because he's only 34 years old, right? You're getting towards, you're like, he's out of his prime now, but... Uh, let me let me know what you think about this, because you have the Eric Anders fight where the fight was just a war, but the performance was really weird because he looked, as usual, he looked strong, he looked powerful, he looked accurate, and it was pretty good, but in the second round, he just looked tired. I don't know if he ended up taking it off, but then in the third round, he just brought out the calculated chaos again, and he ended up coming up top in most exchanges, which got him the win over Eric Anders. So I don't know if he was slowing down, I don't know if he needs to take a break at this point in his career, but... You also have the Chris Curtis split decision loss where, in my opinion, this fight could have gone either way, and it was just a really, really slow, dirty boxing match, and for some reason, I just, I, something felt off about this fight. He wasn't fighting like himself, Marc-Andre Burial, I'm talking about, like, was it because he fought very slow at the pace of Chris Curtis? I don't know, or if I don't know that, it, it could be the reason that he's actually aging now, or the damage is kind of catching up to him. That could not be the case, but... I would love for any, if anybody's interested in giving me their opinion, I would love to know in the comments down below because I'm having trouble figuring out what's going on with Marc-Andre Barriol because he's coming off of two really weird performances. But you could look in on the other side of the coin where he's coming off of three wins in a row because the Chris Curtis fight could have gone either way. I'm interested to see where Joe Pfeiffer comes back because after this last fight, it's the first time where he was really, really made out to be the nail. And we know that Joe Pfeiffer is a very... <laughs> memes aside, he's a very salty and arrogant guy. He has the entire internet making fun of him now. He just took a, his first really, really embarrassing loss. Sometimes guys can come back, they can use that as fuel, and sometimes they can kind of break. And that could be Marc-Andre Barriol, who does have good leg kicks. Maybe he can chew up Joe Pfeiffer. I think this fight determined. This fight will be determined. Well, also, another thing before I say that, another thing is Joe Pfeiffer could very well just work on his cardio. But if you're really hammering people at the beginning of the fight like Joe Pfeiffer does, I don't know if that'll be the case. I would imagine that his cardio is going to look similar. This is a three-round fight. Joe Pfeiffer has one or two good rounds in him, assuming that this is the same Joe Pfeiffer. And Marc-Andre Barriol does have cardio to go three rounds, but he has looked a little bit strange as of recently. I would assume that Joe Pfeiffer would come forward, as he usually does, and be extremely aggressive. I think that actually he has the potential to put Marc-Andre Burial away because Marc-Andre will have no issues getting into a firefight, and if they get into a firefight, I believe Joe Pfeiffer will come out on top in that firefight. It could be a three-round war, and Marc-Andre Burial might not get put away by Joe Pfeiffer, in which case Marc-Andre Burial will absolutely take over in the third round and be make Joe Pfeiffer be the nail again. But in reality, I'm worried about the damage Marc-Andre Burial has taken over his career, and he's had two weird performances in a row, in my opinion. He's 34 years old. He's never been an insane world beater, where Joe Pfeiffer, at least at the beginning of fights, sometimes he does look like he can hang with the top of the division. We were all talking about this guy like he could become champion. That could have been a one-off performance, too. So as of right now, I am going to pick Joe Pfeiffer to get the win. I think he's going to come out, and I think he's going to storm Mark andre Bar Barrio right away, and I would imagine that he will end up finishing the fight in that sense. So I am going to pick Joe Pfeiffer, Worried about that pick, but I'm going to pick him for who I hope wins, guys. You know what's funny is, I used to, when Joe Pfeiffer came onto the scene, I was a big fan of the guy. I thought, I, I respected his story. He came from very, very little. Dana White gave him a chance, and he's making the most of that chance. But I don't like what I've been seeing from him recently, man. So I'm actually going to cheer for Marc-Andre Barriol, somebody who I've liked throughout his entire career. But let's take a look at the odds over on Odds Jam. You can see that in the average odds are minus 253 for Joe Pfeiffer. That makes sense again. I think it may be just minus 200. That's where I would put it at personally. But you also have an over and under 2.5 rounds right now. The over, I actually I actually don't hate that. I really, really don't hate that because I can see this fight being a war and then Joe Pfeiffer kind of slowing down. Very, very interesting. I cannot wait for this entire card, guys, because we have so many more fights to talk about. I cannot wait, man. But my pick is going to be Joe Pfeiffer. Now, guys, let's move on to another fight, which is very fun on the card. We have Carlos Hernandez versus Ray Tets in. I'm sorry, guys. Wrong scene again. <laughs> Ray Tsuriya, and I apologize for pronouncing his name wrong. Ray is coming into the UFC. He is brand new off of the road to the UFC, and he's looked really, really good so far. Something to note is that he's only 22 years old. I'll start with Ray because he is a fighter who's getting a lot of notoriety right now because he is a training partner with Tetsuro Taira, who has proven 
that he has championship material and this could be a very good guy to be very close to. But he is an all-round fighter who can honestly, he can finish the fight anywhere. He seems to, as of so far, and he hasn't taken on a guy like Carlos Hernandez, I'll say that, but he does shine in the grappling because from what we've seen, he uses smooth transitions and he does have sneaky attacks on the ground and he does have good striking too. It just, it seems like he's more of a grappler than a striker, but he has, he has really nice clinch work and the striking's okay, but he's taken on Carlos Hernandez. And I believe everybody's counting Carlos Hernandez out as a contender in general. Carlos Hernandez is a striker with a lot of experience for a guy with his 9-3 and three pro career so far. He, he's a striker with a ton of technique, nice jab, really nice side-to-side -side movement. This dude is incredibly elusive when he's on, and the key word being when he's on. He seems to be like two steps ahead of his opponents. He has great counters, incredible precision. He uses his elusiveness to put, he uses his elusiveness to put the pressure on, but it's it, he does a good job at being the aggressor in that sense because... He uses his movement and the way he is just, like I said, like the way, best way I can describe him is elusive. He uses that to be the aggressor without necessarily overwhelming you and being the aggressor. He does have an improving ground game, but as of right now, that seems to be a clear path to victory against Carlos Hernandez, okay? This is the issue. He's 9-3. and three. I think that he is so much better than the recent performance because he took a loss against now Alan Nascimento and both Tatsuro Tyra. Okay, against Dennis Bondar. This dude looked like he, this, this is the problem with Carlos Hernandez because sometimes he looks like a world beater and sometimes he just comes in and loses because like against Dennis Bondar, who is a good fighter, he looked like he was championship material over here, but then he just didn't have a good a performance at all against Tatsuro Tyra. But then again, you could look at that. Tatsuro Tyra could be on his way to become champion right now. So I don't think, I think Carlos Hernandez needs to iron out a couple things in his game, but as of right now, man. As, and I, I worry about the hole in the grappling. Like, But then again, his grappling seems to be improving. It seems to be. And we know it's a hole. He knows it's a hole in his game. I would imagine he's going to continuously improve it as much as possible because the striking is there. Ray is 22 years old. 9-0. He hasn't fought anybody to the level of Carlos Hernandez, in my opinion. And I know that Carlos Hernandez isn't exactly something special. But I honestly, I believe he has the potential to be something special. I think this is, for your first UFC fight... Ray Tetsuruya is being thrown into the wolves with Carlos Hernandez over here. I think he's a great fighter, and I am going to pick him to win. Problem is, the ground game is an issue. The ground game is an issue, so that's why I'm kind of sitting at like a 70-30 for my prediction over here. But I will pick Carlos Hernandez. I think that this is a step down in competition for him, and we don't know where Ray fits in against a guy like Carlos Hernandez yet. So that's why I'm going to be picking him. And honestly, guys, I like Ray, but I hope Carlos Hernandez gets the job done because the dude is really really a pleasure to watch and what's interesting right here let me know if i'm crazy the average odds are minus 414 for ray coming off of the road to ufc not taking a guy like carlos hernandez i think people are really really underestimating carlos hernandez here and i am probably going to be throwing a bet on him likely likely be throwing a bet on him i want to look a little bit more into ray's ground game to get an idea like can he actually take down carlos hernandez because that's a clear path to victory for him but I want to take a little bit. I want to take a look a little bit more towards his actual technique before making a decision, which is strange for me because I don't usually go back and do tape study. <laughs> but like, I, I I got a good feeling about Carlos Hernandez here, man. I got a good feeling. I'm not like super confident to win, but as an underdog, as that much of an underdog, I like him a lot. I don't know about the odds here for the over under. I don't. I, I would. I wouldn't touch that one. But man. My pick's going to be Carlos Hernandez, and I hope that he gets the job done. Let's continue on to the next fight, guys. We have Michelle Watterson Gomez versus Jillian Robertson. Why do I keep doing that? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm still getting used to my stream deck over here, guys. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you have Michelle Watterson Gomez, who is a fighter who is completely past her prime at this point. And at this point, I kind of look at her like she's free money. Jillian Robertson sometimes drops the ball, though. So, I mean, like, the, the upset wouldn't be that shocking, but... Michelle Watterson Gomez, a karate style fighter with some BJJ behind it, but unfortunately, she's old, she's a mom, she sucks now, and that's been evident in her four losses, especially in her most recent loss to Marina Rodriguez, where she got absolutely murdered. What was the worst beatdown, Marina Rodriguez versus Michelle Watterson Gomez, or Peyton Talbot versus Cameron Simon? Let me know in the comments down below. I actually think Michelle might have gotten... No, I don't know. I don't know. That's two really, really bad performances. Anyways, she's taking on Jillian Robertson, who is a great grappler for the division, but she has weak hands. Here's the problem. Michelle Watterson's 38. She doesn't, from an outside perspective, I don't know Michelle Watterson. I don't follow her career that closely, but she seems to be a little bit checked out 
She's really focused on family. She's still training. She's I would imagine she's fighting to make money. That's my guess. Not that everybody isn't, but you know what I, you know what I mean. You guys know what I mean. It's not necessarily to come and become a champion. Because a little while ago you were listening to Michelle Waterson every 5 seconds she was like, "I want to prove to my daughter that I can be the champion and be a mom." You know, that seemed to be her whole thing, but you don't really hear her talking about that too much anymore. Maybe she's coming to an understanding that won't happen, but regardless, man, she's looked horrible in her performances. Horrible. Absolutely horrible. Absolutely horrible. But Jillian Robertson, she, I thought she was improving, man. When she went on this two-fight win streak over here, I thought that, I was like, okay, maybe Jillian Robertson can make her way up the division. But then she had the Tabitha Ritchie loss, which I was very disappointed in. But then she had bounced back against Pollyanna Viana with a really, really good performances. And she ended up getting a finish, actually, which... In this fight, it's important to note that I don't think we should rate Jillian Roberts in very well for having his performance because Pollyanna Viana at this point just sucks. She sucks. So I think that just this is the way that I'm looking at this fight, okay? You have Michelle Watterson Gomez who is old and is sucks now. You have Jillian Robertson who sometimes sucks but sucks less than Michelle Watterson Gomez. But if the fight goes to the ground, Jillian Robertson does have serious technique there. Serious technique. She's just not a complete fighter. So I'm going to pick Jillian Robertson, for sure. I don't think Michelle Robertson Gomez has it anymore. And I'm going to pick Jillian Robertson, for sure. And for who I would like to see win the fight, guys, I would really like to see Jillian Robertson win the fight. I know I was just dogging on her technique a little bit, but I do like her. I like Jillian Robertson. She's easy to cheer for, man. So you can see that she, Jillian Robertson is only almost a minus 200 favorite. That's crazy to me. I really do believe that this fight should be close to, like, minus four or 500 for Jillian Robertson because Michelle Watterson Gomez, she... Have you, has nobody watched her last fights? She is like beyond washed. Beyond washed. The only reason I can see an upset here is because sometimes Jillian Robertson drops the ball and it's WMA. So anything can happen in that sense. But Jillian Robertson should absolutely 100% win this fight. Now guys, let's keep moving on to the next fight. This fight has the potential to break my heart, dude, because we have Cub Swanson versus Andre Feely. Guys, if you've been following the channel, you may or may not know that Cub Swanson is one of my favorite fighters of all time. Big, big fan of this guy, and I'm glad to see he's still fighting, and he's fighting pretty strong at 41 years old. I'll start with Cub Swanson, who is, we all know Cub Swanson at this point. He is a very flashy, creative, yet technical kickboxer with great cardio, a lot of toughness, and boy, does this dude have the will to win. He has great movement, great counters as well. The only problem is Cub Swanson at this point in his career is clearly aging, and that showed in his last fight against Hakeem Dawudu, which... Was a close fight. There was a lot of controversy on the on the decision, but I personally thought this fight could have gone either way. But his power looked really nice, and it held up for the entire fight. But he did finally start to slow down in the second round. And the big takeaway from it, because there's a big difference in Cubs' recent performances and the Hakeem fight, in my opinion, because he has been relatively inactive. You can see that this was almost two years ago. So we we're kind of worried about what Cub Swanson would show up. So Cub definitely has it. And this is a big takeaway. Cub Swanson definitely has it and can still scrap. He's just not the same killer that he used to be. That's how I'm looking at Cub Swanson at this point. I believe that's the correct way to look at Cub Swanson. He's taking on Andre Feely, who is kind of in a similar spot in his career. He's 23 and 11, just can't put it together. He's a kickboxer with really good footwork and technique, and he does have an underrated ground game to back that up. So you have two guys that I would imagine I'd be shocked if this fight went to the ground. They're two really good kickboxers who are in, kind of stuck in their career because you have Andre Feely, who's... He's, I will say, though, both guys have taken on super tough opponents. Super, super tough opponents. Because you can just look at everybody and it's Andre Feely. Like, this dude has been put through the ringer. But same with Cub Swanson, man. He's been taking on some crazy, crazy fighters with the exception of maybe Daniel Pineda. <laughs> but regardless, man, Cub still has it. Andre Feely, I, I actually question if Andre Feely still has it. Because he looks like he can't take the same amount of damage that he used to. He seems to be a little bit slower, but he's still, like, he's still, the technique is there. He's he's not washed by any means. It's just, Andre Feely, I don't know. I don't know. I think we kind of figured out where Andre Feely belongs in the division. He had all the potential in the world, but he seems to be just not putting it together. Oh, this is a tough fight, man. This is a tough fight. <sighs> this should be a pick'em. I think it's a pick'em fight. I'm very hesitant to pick up Swanson because he's almost 41 years old and he did looked he did look slow in his last fight. Really slow. It's just not the same guy. He's not the same guy that he is. Well, it's the power's still there. But you can't Cub Swanson can't I don't know, man. I don't know. He's clearly not the same fighter. That's the problem. Clearly not. But Andre Feely, is he the guy to kind of get the jump over Cub Swanson? He could be. He could use his reach very well for this fight. He's going to be taller. 
How much is Cub Swanson aging? I don't know, man. I think this should be close to a pick'em fight, in my opinion. But for the sake of the video, if you made me put my money on it, I'd I'd pick Cub Swanson. I'd pick Cub Swanson, but I am not feeling good about that pick at all. But for guys, for who I would like to see win, Cub Swanson is literally one of my favorite fighters of all time. Been a big fan of him ever since I started watching the sport, and I it'd be a real feel good moment for me to see this dude win. I wish him nothing but the best. Uh, Cub Swanson is one of my favorite fighters of all time. Let's continue on over to the odds jam over here. You have. Andre Feely sitting at around a minus 200 favorite. So I guess that makes sense, man, because Cub had a really, really wonky performance in his last fight. He's been inactive, and Andre Feely's still young. He's going to have a reach advantage. Like, that kind of makes sense to me. You have an over-under, too, which I don't even trust that, to be honest. I don't even trust that. But regardless, man, regardless, it's gonna be, it's a weird fight to break down. Let me know what you think about this one in the comment section. Now, guys, sorry to put a really quick pause on the video over here, but I do want to advertise the channel membership in Odds Jam. If you don't want to hear it, just skip. The timestamps will be there if you'd like to skip. But, of course, I talk a lot about betting on this channel, so if you guys are interested in either supporting the channel or seeing my official bets every single Thursday or Friday before an event, either UFC or whatever MMA event I'm going to be betting on, I will be posting a members-only video and members-only community post with what I'm actually doing with my own money and going to give my reasons, my confidence levels, all that kind of things. If you're interested in seeing, maybe putting into your own research, if you want to tail, which I don't suggest you do, I never suggest you would blindly tail, but if you want, either want to see what I'm, where I'm actually putting my money, where my mouth is, or supporting the channel, check out the channel membership. You can find it in the pinned comment description down below or next to the subscribe button. Very cheap compared to other channels. And also, if you would like to use Odds Jam, which is a fantastic tool for betting if you're a serious better, it has so many amazing tools. You can get a discount over at Oz Jam by using my link in the pinned comment in the description down below and using code CLENBAT. You can get a discount when you sign up, especially if you have multiple sports books. This is where it really shines. It's a really, really great tool. And Oz Jam is, I, I support Oz Jam, man. So if you're interested, go check out that link or checking out the channel membership. Guys, thank you very, very much for listening. Sorry for, I try to make that quick, but it never ends up being that quick. So thank you for listening. Now guys, let's move on to another fight on the card. We have Ian Machado Gary taking on Michael Venom Page, a great and very, very important fight for the division. You have Ian Gary, who honestly very well could be the future. I know it's a meme to clown on Ian Gary right now, but the reality is, is he is a fantastic fighter. He is a great fighter, great fighter, excuse me, like I just said, he's a great kickboxer with awesome calf kicks and he does, okay, he uses his range perfectly, and he oddly doesn't have long arms. He just makes himself seem longer than he actually is. But he, other than that, he has insanely, insanely sneaky knees. That's something people don't talk about in his game. He's confident, he's precise, he's active, and he definitely has the will to overcome adversity to get some wins. Now, something that we recently learned from Ian Gary is he seems to sometimes struggle with pressure. If someone's on him, he can be hit quite a bit. We were worried about that recently. How many fights was that ago? Against the Kanan Song, it was just four fights ago where he, I look at this in a good way, where he overcame adversity in this fight and then ended up getting a win. Had two really clean performances against Neil Magny and Daniel Rodriguez, but in the Jeff Neal fight, it was a split decision win, and I thought this was a very close fight. It could have gone either way, and the, like it, it was super, super close. Now, in this fight, he did, and I think this is very important because Jeff Neal is, is a better He's the top of the competition that Ian Gary has faced so far. He did a really good job at doing what he usually does, but Neil did give him trouble with the pressure. He found himself clinching and eating shots on the inside. I kind of got left on this performance where Ian Gary, he is definitely a very skilled and a very good fighter, but I'm no longer hyped that he is championship material. He very well could be. He is definitely could still be improving. He's not even 27 years old yet, so... That could change, but like as of right now, I don't think that Ian Gary is the future. He could be the future, but I don't think that he is at this moment. Another thing that I did want to talk about with Ian Gary is something that I was really worried about in the, in the Jeff Neal fight was, for the first time, Ian Gary had the entire internet and society as a whole just straight up laughing at him. That had to have taken a toll on him. That had to have taken a toll on him mentally. I didn't know if he would show up in the cage and kind of be the same guy, but he showed that he can overcome that. He showed in previous fights that he can overcome adversity, so Ian Gary is the real deal. He's taking on Michael Page. Michael Venom Page been watching him for years, man. Years. I'm a, I'm a fan of Michael Page. He's an incredible striker with incredible movement, accuracy, timing, and power. He's extremely elusive, and he can hit you from anywhere. I was worried for a little while now 
that because Michael Page he coming to the UFC, like, of course, he ended up having the loss just two years ago, and he's been inactive since because he had one more fight in Bellator just over a year ago and then had his debut against Kevin Holland three months ago. He's been aging quickly, so I was worried about in the Kevin Holland fight specifically about his cardio, but it was perfect. It was perfect. He was throwing with full power the entire time, moving like crazy. His cardio is perfect, so I have no reason to believe that Michael Page is aging right now because he just absolutely styled on Kevin Holland the whole time. There was even a point where he fell to the ground and showed good defense. So he's been still improving. We know Michael Page has been working on his grappling. Not that it was a hole in his game or anything. It's just he's been really, really working to become a well-rounded MMA fighter for the top of the division. Again, not that he wasn't, but he's just still putting in the work to improve his skills. When these two match up, I, I, got, I, I think Michael Page is going to get it done, guys. I do. I think that Michael Venom Page definitely belongs in the top five of the division. Then you bring some questions. But I don't like the fact that Ian Gary is going to have a significant reach disadvantage over here because Michael Page is also a fighter who uses his range perfectly. This is going to be the first time that Ian Gary is fighting someone as powerful as Michael Page, as elusive as Michael Page, somebody who can match Ian Gary's movement and probably even have better movement than Ian Gary. I think that Michael Page is going to get the job done. I really do. Now, Ian Gary is a fantastic fighter himself. He's a great kickboxer. This fight's definitely going to be on the feet. And like I said, he has very sneaky knees. He's a great kickboxer. He can absolutely catch Michael Page. And throughout his career, Michael Page has been caught. I just, I think the movement's going to be too much. And I think that he is, this is a different animal that Ian Gary has taken on. If Ian Gary goes out there and destroys Michael Page like we've seen him destroy so many guys, then I'll be like, woohoo, look out top of the division. Ian Gary is here. But as of right now, I am not, I'm no longer convinced about Ian Gary at this moment. I think Michael Page is going to get the job done. And I don't know if he's going to finish Ian Gary, but I can see another performance where Michael Page is just too quick for him. He's too quick. I don't think he's going to get embarrassed, but I think Michael Page is going to win a clear striking match to a decision. Now, for who I would like to see in this fight, guys, I don't like Ian Gary. <laughs> I'm with the rest of the world, man. I hope Michael Page gets the job done. Plus, I have a soft spot for Bellator, guys, because I've been watching Bellator with my dad for a very for years since I started watching the sport. So I like Michael Page. been watching him for a long time. He's extremely entertaining. And you can see over on Odds Jam that this is about a pick'em fight, which is very interesting. And honestly, that makes sense. That makes sense. It's a You have a young guy, an improving guy like Ian Machado. Gary's been destroying people. Michael Page, who... We still have questions where he exactly belongs in the UFC. I think I kind of a gauge on that, but still, it's a that makes sense for the odds. And I'm considering throwing a bet on Michael Page, but a little bit risky. I don't know if I'm actually going to pull the trigger on that. Again, if you're interested, check out the membership to see where I actually end up putting my money. <laughs> Let's continue on, guys. Now, guys, moving on, we have the only stinker of the card. A fight that 100% belongs at the top of the division. Sorry, again. We have May Bueno Silva taking on Macy Chiasson. Now, I don't know about you guys. I don't care about this fight. I don't have the energy to even really go too in-depth about this fight. You have Mayra Bueno Silva, who is a great BJJ fighter for the division and good power for the division. She's strong in the clinch and can be quite explosive in the first round. But something that we've learned recently is she definitely has lackluster cardio. And it might be because she's been off of PEDs because against Holly Holm, she failed a PED test. And as usual, fighters are talking about like, well, it wasn't me. It was a tainted supplement. But Mayra Bueno Silva was probably cheating. But she's taken on Macy Chieson who is a big girl for the division. You can see that she's going to have a significant height advantage and a decent reach advantage. She's strong in the clinch, has take, decent takedowns, decent submissions, and she has good cardio. <sighs> is it even worth going through all of their recent performances? I don't I don't care to do it, guys. I really don't. <laughs> I'm sorry. This fight has no business being on the main card. This fight has no business. This division has no business existing. I'm going to, I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to pick Macy Chiasson. She's going to have a reach advantage, a height advantage. She can fight longer than Mayro Bano Silva, and Silva did nothing in her last loss. Could be because she's off of PEDs, but that's kind of where I'm sitting at. I don't care who wins, so let's see what Odds Jam has to say over here. We have Mayro Bueno Silva at a minus 202 average odds favorite over here. You have the over, which is minus at the same thing too, which totally makes sense, and that's probably a parlay piece over here. I'll probably consider doing that myself, but... Yeah, those odds make sense. Let's get into the insanely, insanely fun fights. <laughs> Moving on, guys, to the co-main event. We have Brian Ortega versus Diego Lopez, a short-notice fight, which I cannot wait for. Guys, I've been on the Diego Lopez train, and I cannot wait to watch this dude perform again. So, we have 
the biggest note of the fight is both guys are taking this fight on short notice. We don't know much about Brian Ortega and how much he's been training right now, but Diego Lopez looks to be in absolutely insane shape right now. Like, actually, you know what? I'll stop the recording for a second and show you guys what I'm talking about. And guys, like, this is exactly what I'm talking about. It took absolutely no, and I didn't realize that until, because I typed in Diego Lopez and I was waiting to see, like, yeah, this didn't take any time to find it all. And Diego Lopez is in insane shape right now. He looks like he's continuously improving over here. I don't even know what this is. Like, I hope it's not playing audio. Okay, good. It's muted. But... <laughs> You are our sunshine, Diego. Like, I love the Diego Lopez means, but this dude is in insane shape. But the problem is, of course, when you're training for a fight camp, that is really, really different than just being in shape. You need to be prepared for a fight. So the point being, guys, and again, using the wrong scene, the point being that uh, you we don't know what's going to happen in this fight because both guys are taking this on short notice. So you have Brian Ortega, who is an amazing grappler with good pressure, super tough, and a bigger heart than, honestly probably anybody in the UFC. Like, if I wanted to do this, and I wanted to make a tier list video, actually, soon, about ranking UFC fighters' hearts, and Brian Ortega would absolutely be, like, in the SS tier. He has a bigger heart than and will to win than almost anybody in MMA. He does have underrated hands, but he still oddly gets hit a lot, so he has good offensive boxing. And you have Diego Lopez, who is a great all-round fighter, who seems to be making improvements every single time that we see him. He's very, very strong with the grappling. His hands are no joke. He can do anything. He has power in his hands, ever since he busted into the UFC, got that loss, which is a really good performance, short notice against Movsar Evloev, he looked good, then went on to absolutely destroy everybody that's in front of him, but the very important thing to note over here is, this is a huge step up in competition at Brian Ortega, okay, Brian Ortega, he's coming off, he, he just had a recent performance after a really, really long layoff with an injury against Yair Rodriguez, and it was a rematch against Yair Rodriguez, so in this fight, it was important, like, I don't... It's a weird performance because Yair, in my opinion, I, I lost money on that fight. I thought Yair was a lock. This fight was at altitude, so that could have played into effect that. And Brian Ortega didn't look that great, too, either way. Like, he, it was his first fight back after a layoff and surgery. The fight was at altitude. And in the first round, he got completely, completely outstruck. And because of Yair and his amazing fight IQ, or he was willing to grapple with Ortega, and Ortega found a finish. But the thing is, Brian Ortega showed that he was still super tough because anybody that was taking that onslaught from Yair Rodriguez in the first round would have folded. But Brian Ortega was tough. He pushed through. He got the win. Perhaps it was a testosterone boost because Tracy Cortez was in the audience. But hey, Brian Ortega still has it. He's shockingly 16-3. and three. Like I, I, You feel like Brian Ortega has a little bit more losses than that. But it is important to note, too, when Brian Ortega did lose, it was against Max Holloway. It was against Alexander Volkanovsky and Yair Rodriguez. And this one, you could argue, was an injury. But... I think that Yair yeah, Rodriguez had perfect technique in that fight. So you have Brian Ortega, which I still don't know exactly how well he's like, again, I don't know how he's coming back after a surgery because you have a combination with that performance with Yair in his stupid fight IQ, the fight being at altitude and him coming back after a long layoff. He could come back better. If the same Brian Ortega that took on this Yair Rodriguez takes on Diego Lopez, I think that Diego Lopez wins. But in saying that, Diego Lopez is on an insane win streak right now, but it's against guys that are not Brian Ortega's level. Movsar Evlo is, is, and he had a good performance there, and that was short notice. So we know that Diego Lopez can hang with the top. Diego Lopez is going to have a slight read advantage, a reach advantage, a slight height advantage. He's in his prime. Brian Ortega is exiting his prime. I think that I'm going to roll, and this is a philosophy that I've been having recently, guys, with Diego Lopez specifically and a couple other guys. I think I'm going to roll with Diego Lopez until the wheels fall off the train. He's been just looking like a killer. He's so aggressive. He's so hungry to get the win. And he's been really thriving off the crowd and thriving off the hype. And he seems to be improving every single time that we see him. I'm going to pick Diego Lopez, but it's not a confident pick at all. We don't know either guy and how fight ready they are right now. Because again, this is on very, very short notice. For who I would like to see win, guys, fan of Diego Lopez over here. I'm not a fan of Brian Ortega. I do not like Brian Ortega, actually. But... You can't deny Brian Ortega is an absolute dog. He's an amazing fighter. And I hope Diego Lopez gets the win. Let's see what the odds are over here. You see Diego Lopez finally... <laughs> I don't actually... Was he... Yeah, no, he was an underdog in his last fight too. I've been cashing in underdog plays on Diego Lopez. But he, we see he's finally the favorite over here. It's a very, very close fight. I'm not going to touch this with my money because... I don't know, because Diego Lopez, he looks like he's in good shape, man. And I just said that... I, I keep thinking I'm going to ride the Lopez train until the wheels fall off, but... It's not a safe bet because it's short notice. It's short notice, just like the main event. 
tough fight, but I'm going to pick Diego Lopez in. Now, guys, let's move on to the new and improved main event, a rematch between Alex Pereira and Yuri Prohoshka. This is a rematch, and it, man, I cannot wait to see the aura between these two and the stare down again. If these guys fought 10 times, it'd probably be 5-5 five, five apiece. You have Alex Pereira, who's a very powerful, accurate, and accomplished kickboxer who often wins by knockout. His power seems to be on another level. He does appear, though, to have a hole in his grappling, but that hasn't seriously been tested yet. So I don't know if that's necessarily fair to say. You have Yuri Prohoshka on the other side, on the other side of the coin, who is an all-round fighter who literally just uses his heart and will to win. He will make any fight chaos and absolute hell to deal with. And if that's the case, he will dominate you. He does eat a ton of shots, but he is super durable. As of right now, the technique and leg kicks can give him an issue. And that's what we've seen in this last fight. But he will not stop his forward pressure. And we saw that in his last fight against Alexander Rakic, man. Crazy. Because, you know what? I'll talk about this fight first, the Alex Pereira. So in this fight... Yuri came off of a really, really bad layoff. After the Glover Teixeira fight, he had supposedly the worst shoulder injury in all of combat sports. He In this fight, though, he did appear rusty, and he had a little bit of success in moments, but the leg kicks really, really restricted his movement. And on the other side of the coin, though, Alex Pereira, like, his leg kicks were money in this fight. He used high fight IQ there. He just was able to restrict Yuri's movement, and that was as expected, and he found a counter and ended up getting a knockout. Now, it's tough because there was also a controversial stoppage there, but Yuri Prohoshka did admit to going out. So I guess it was a really good, it was a, excuse me, it ended up being a good stoppage, but both guys ended up fighting on UFC 300. You have Yuri Prohoshka who looked, okay, didn't look good, <laughs> but he didn't look rusty. He didn't look rusty. In the fight against Alex Perr, he did look rusty. So in the Alexander Rakic fight, you have, I'll start with this because they both fought at UC 300. Like I said, Alex Pereira ended up getting a really quick KO against Jamal Hill. Not controversial despite what Jamal Hill wants to say about it, but Yuri was getting murdered for two rounds. Murdered un until he ended up catching Rakic and almost finishing the fight. He literally won by outwilling him. And that's what we see with Yuri Prohoshka, man, because, like, especially in this fight, his heart's on another level. He took so much damage. Nobody in the UFC would push through and oppose his will like Yuri Prohoshka did in this fight. And I also said in this fight that I will never bet against Yuri Prohoshka again. I lost money on Rakic because I thought Rakic is a far superior fighter. And that's the problem with this matchup. You have Alex Pereira. Technical-wise, he is the superior fighter. Especially in the striking. I would imagine this fight's going to stay standing. I don't imagine Yuri Prohoshka is going to go for the takedown. In which you could argue that Yuri Prohoshka probably has the advantage over there. But then again, Alex Pereira has been putting some work all over Teixeira for a very long time. He's just learning things from Kayla Harrison right now. So he's taking the ground game very seriously. And according to their camp, he is still improving his ground game. He's working on it very, very hard. But Yuri Prohoshka obviously... He submitted Glover to Shara, but then again, is, uh, submitting an old man after dragging him through a war, how much you really want to put in that, taking that into consideration. Yuri's just a wild guy no matter where the fight goes. So, you have a problem with this fight because Alex Pereira is the technically superior fighter, but Yuri makes every single fight hell. We know that Alex Pereira can get knocked out. We know that Yuri Prohoshka can get knocked out. <sighs> Yuri's going to show up to this fight not rusty. Or then again, maybe he will be rusty because that's another thing that's into, that you need to take into consideration is that both guys are taking this fight on short notice. Who knows if they're in shape? Both guys look like they're in shape. Yuri Prohoshka seems to live the life where he can take the fight at any point. Alex Pereira looks to be in shape still. He's probably going to be cutting a lot of weight. That's something to take into consideration because he wasn't prepping for a weight cut. He could show up drained. We know he walks around at, what, 228-ish, 230? I don't know what Yuri walks around at, but there's so many factors to take into consideration for this fight. Guys, like I said, man, when these two match up, if they were to fight 10 times, it'd probably be five apiece. So I believe this fight should be closer to pick him, but I'm actually going to pick Yuri Prohoshka. He's still in his prime. The last time around, he was super rusty. He showed that he's the same Yuri against Alexander Rakic, and I could see if Alex Pereira is knocking Yuri out. He's using the leg kicks because Rakic did the same thing. He destroyed Yuri's movement with the leg kicks. He murdered him. He murdered Yuri Prohoshka, and Yuri Prohoshka walked forward like a zombie and just outwilled him to get the win. And I think that he can, I, I, I can see him doing that to Alex Pereira again. Not again, but I mean like it, repeating the same thing in a fight. But I will say when the day comes where Yuri's chin gets cracked or he shows up because he took too much damage because every single fight with Yuri Prohoshka is an absolute chaos mess. The day is going to come where his chin's not going to look the same. And Alex Pereira could crack that chin. 
That's something we were worried about coming in with the Alexander Rakic fight is, is Yuri's chin going to be the same? Because he just, he finally got knocked out. He showed that he's still there. He still has it. Rakic hit him with everything in the book. I'm kind of convincing myself to pick Yuri in this fight. I'm going to, I think it's, it should be a pick him fight because like I said, I wholeheartedly believe that if these guys fought 10 times, five times, it would be a piece, a piece each. So I will pick Yuri Prohoshka. He has a youth advantage. He definitely has the will advantage and he's going to show up supposedly not rusty again. But then again, that's another reason why you shouldn't bet on this fight is because it, it, both guys took us on short notice. You got to worry about Alex Pereira's weight cut him being drained. I can see him going out. For who I'd like to see win, guys, I am actually such a big fan of both of these guys, but I can't not cheer for Yuri. I want him to get his title back. I, I'm i a huge fan of Yuri. Here's the thing. I'm a huge fan of both guys, but I'm a bigger fan of Yuri Prohoshka. Alex Pereira had his shine. I want Yuri Prohoshka to have the shine back. So I'm going to pick Yuri Prohoshka to win, and I'm going to be cheering for Yuri Prohoshka. And you can see, man, you can see at, at Oz Jam, Alex Pereira is a very, very slight favorite. Makes sense to me. It's understandable for him to be a slight favorite. Makes all the sense in the world. There's not too much else to break down there. I'm definitely not betting on this fight, and I don't believe you guys should honestly be betting on this fight either. It is, It should be a pick em fight. I don't think you should bet on the co-main event either. Short notice. Anthony Smith took the fight on short notice as well. But then again, you could bet on Carl Solberg for that reason. But you got to be careful for this card in particular, guys. You got to be really, really careful, especially with the betting. But guys, that's going to do it for this full card breakdown. I feel like I've been talking for a little while. So let me know what you think about the picks down below. Let me know if you're going to be betting on anything. The complete betting guide will be out tomorrow. Thank you very, very much for watching the video. I really appreciate you sticking around with me the whole time if you have. If you want, you can check out one of these two videos on screen right now, though. On the top, you can see a reaction and breakdown to everything that my, my camera just started tracking me for some reason that Michael Chandler was going crazy about in the forest. And below, YouTube thinks that you'll like this video the best, guys. I will see you in either video. Take care.